Hello, my name is Voya and welcome to My Deep Guide. Well, today we are finally taking an in-depth look at the brand new accessory from Remarkable for Remarkable 2, and that is the Remarkable 2 Type Folio. A keyboard style folio for the Remarkable 2 only. It doesn't work on the Remarkable. Before we dive in, if you do like the work that I do, please do like and subscribe to the channel so that you get notified when new videos come out on My Deep Guide. And also do check out the mydeepguide.com slash shop where you can find the My Daily Organizer, which is a hyperlinked PDF file organizer that satisfies all of your personal or professional yearly, quarterly, monthly, weekly, daily organizing and day diary needs. And if you're interested to find out more details about it, you can check out uh, the playlist, the My Daily Organizer playlist in the description below to figure out if that is a product that is good for you or not. And now onwards to check out what the type folio is really like. All right, and here is the Remarkable Type Folio. In this case, it's the ink black version. Full disclosure, Remarkable has sent me this one to review. So this is not mine, but as usual, this is not a sponsored video. So I get to say whatever I want and what I honestly think about this product. So as you can see, I've already opened it so that I can test it out, but I've placed it back into the box so that I can show you what the unboxing experience is like. And um, yeah, let's commence and see what do you get uh, in this $200 US dollars, or in the case of Canadian dollars, 300 Canadian dollars accessory for the Remarkable. Well, the first thing that I've noticed when I received it is that this is heavy. This is actually like feels heavier than the device itself. So I expected it to be kind of weighty, but this is uh, more than what I expected. It comes in the traditional remarkable uh, package and nothing really uh, kind of out of the ordinary here. It's a nice normal package here. And on the back, you will see that you have the indication of which language edition you have received of the type folio. As normally, you would carefully break the seal here, not tear, no. And then we can just pull this out. And immediately you are greeted by the, uh, the cover itself. One thing that I'm missing from a $200 package is that it would have been nice if there was like a little cloth to help simply pop this one out. So instead, I don't have this to pop it out. I have to resort to something like this. Once you get the folio, you pop it open and you get the quick start guide welcoming you. First, make sure that your Remarkable 2 is turned on, connect to Wi-Fi and update to the latest software version. Okay. Then snap your device into place and gently lift the side tabs shown above to and push your tablet back to reveal the keyboard. And then step three, you can adjust the position of your type folio for focused reading, typing or writing. And here is the remarkable type folio. So um, it is uh, really, really nicely built. It is hefty and it does offer quite a bit of width. Well, first of all, the surface is artificial leather and uh, it feels really good in the hand. When you open it up, the first thing you notice is that is there is a magnetic holder. So they hold really, really well and both corners attach very nicely. The only unfortunate thing is that Remarkable 2 does not have a little ma magnet on itself to actually read the opened or closed stage of the flipbook cover, type fully included. So auto sleep and auto wake up function, unfortunately, is still not going to be an option. Once you open it up, you're greeted by the surface here. This is the uh, area on the side where it's plastic. So maybe for 200 bucks, I would hope that it was metal, especially because the surface of the Remarkable is metal. So then you have this kind of 
little discrepancy between the sides. Um, and over here we have the communication port that finally makes use of the Remarkables, I believe this is called a pogo port or something like that. But either way, this one slots into here and that's how Remarkable will know that it has a keyboard. And you just simply slide your device here, which is attracted magnetically into place like so, and then you pop it back and that's it. And then your Remarkable is in place. And this is the whole package. And then all of a sudden you go from 4.7 millimeters, which is the world's thinnest tablet, all the way up to 13 millimeters, which is almost three times as thick. So that is something that you definitely have to keep in mind, that this cover adds a lot and when I say a lot of thickness, I really do mean a lot of thickness to the Remarkable package itself. And while we're talking about the add addition of things, this thing becomes massively heavy. How massively heavy? Well, the device on its own with, uh, so just the Remarkable with the Marker Plus weighs in at 417 grams. The Type Folio, on its own, just the type folio weighs more than that, 455 grams, which means that your combined total is going to be at around 870 grams. Now we're still not approaching the one kilo category like with the books Tab Ultra, which is also massive, super thick and really heavy. But uh, this is uh, this is a hefty hefty package. So not only does the comfort and luxury of typing for the Remarkable 2 come at a very hefty price, but it also comes at a, a very hefty addition of weight and very hefty addition of width for the entire package. Uh, type cover doesn't have a dedicated place for the, uh, for the pen because there's simply no need for it because the, yeah, this is where your pen lies. One thing that you need to be aware of though, is that it doesn't have any kind of safety uh, safeguards to keep that pen in place. Like for example, the book Stab Ultra has this one flap that goes over and then you can hit that pen as much as you want. It's gonna be, you know, in, held in place. While as that is certainly not true with the um, remarkable type folio. There's one thing that we have to mention and talk about when we're talking about the availability and the price of the remarkable type folio. As I've already mentioned, it's a very pricey accessory, 200 US dollars, 300 Canadian dollars. It's a lot of, to ask for something like that, but that's not the only problem. Currently, if you go um, and try to order one, you are able to buy one, you are able to pay for one, but when you're going to receive one is actually not certain or guaranteed when it's going to be because they say limited availability and you know please wait and see and uh, there's uh, zero reason to do things that way if Remarkable knew and they had to know at some point that there's going to be a manufacturing or delivery delay or something like that but at the very least they would have had a stock inventory so they would know by December, uh, December, March 7th, how much they have in stock, right? So what they should have done actually is just make sure that the uh, while there's stock that people can actually purchase and they can start the delivery immediately on those purchases, that you have the order button. Once they run out of stock, they can have a pre-order or pre-purchase or whatever they want to call it with, this is the important part, with the uh, uh, information to at least know roughly how long is or what's the delivery estimate date? Is it going to be in three to five days? Is it going to be in seven to 14 days? 21 days? 30 days? 
we don't know at this point. And the problem here is that a lot of buyers hit that buy button only to get after the fact a notification, oh, we're sorry, there's a delay. Now with the Remarkable 2 launch, first of all, it was 2020 and it was you know, height of Corona. Second of all, it was a Kickstarter thing, so it was a pre-order thing, and then it's kind of expected that you have at least one delay. This is an entirely different story. This is a product launch. And if you don't know what your quantity is going to be for the product launch, that is a problem. Now, there's a counter argument here as well, which is definitely valid. Remarkable is entering an unknown territory, so they do not know how many people are going to be interested in this. Valid argument, perfectly. But again, that's why you then implement the order slash batch pre-order kind of thing, so that if you've underestimated the demand and your stock gets sold out, that you don't start taking money from the uh, customers only to, after the fact, tell them, hey, it's out of stock, sorry, uh, wait and we'll tell you when it's going to be. I'll you know, deliver to you. That one's not okay. The third thing that's not okay and should have been done is to allow people to actually cancel their orders and get their money back if they choose to do so, which is, to my knowledge, not something that you can do at the moment. And the fourth one, according to JB from Morning Coach, who made a really, really good video on this as well, and that is his personal experience is definitely on this. And it's a really, really important video to check out to see firsthand what his personal experience was with this kind of purchasing thing and thank him a lot for actually bringing this uh, to the community's attention. Fourth one is, in his case, for example, he wanted to change a shipping address for an item that has been delayed and not shipped yet, yet they told him that he can't do it and that he has to wait for the delayed shipment to start and then tell DHL to change the address. That makes absolutely zero sense. This this is again bizarre type of behavior and we get to see a really well made, uh, a really good performance on hardware design, eh, mediocre performance on the uh, software side of things, excellent marketing material, really good organization wise, like this, this, how this has been handled is an absolute blah like an example of how not to do things. As far as the uh, features of the outside features, I think it looks beautifully stylish. It's really, really beautiful and it's really, really simple and elegant, really, really nicely made. And the only thing that you have in front is this uh, remarkable logo that is relief and it kind of sticks out ever so slightly from the front of the or the surface of the um, type folio. So uh, the way that it operates and how you function is something that I think is uh, just another example of brilliant engineering and design and another testament to how valuable and how good the uh, engineering team of the hardware side of things at Remarkable actually is. It's no secret, everybody knows who follows my channel, that I am a great admirer uh, of the Remarkable 2 design. I think that even now, two and a half years later, it is a brilliant design and if it came out today, it would still feel modern, it would still feel uh, as good as, uh, as a design as it was. Is it a perfect manufacturing kind of approach? Nope, it has some issues because of the thinness, but let's focus on the design solutions here. So traditionally, the type covers on all of the devices look like this. You flip it open and here is your keyboard. You plop it into there and then you type, right? So this is the Books Tab Ultra, but it doesn't have to be Books Tab Ultra. It can be uh, my Lenovo Tab P11. It can be the iPad. It can be anything. This is how keyboard covers work, right? Well, yes, up until the invention or the introduction of the type folio. So what's the problem with this? Well, the problem with this is something that I never liked on these and something that a lot of people kind of figure out. It's uh, you get the keys resting atop of your screen directly. 
And over time, that's not a big deal to begin with, but over time, that will start to leave mark on your screens. And anyone with a, a touchscreen laptop will attest to that, that if you've had it for more than two, three years, you will start to see kind of little marks of the uh, keyboard on your screen. And that is unavoidable because you have different types of surfaces constantly kind of brushing up against a screen and micro movements like here, it's like constantly pressing and it's constantly being pressed on the screen. So that's one of the things that I don't like about it. Type Folio and the folks at the Remarkable had a completely different approach and it works like this. You open it up, it's still a tablet. Flip it around, it's still a tablet. It still works exactly as you want. You want it to turn into a keyboard. You have these two little protrusions on the side. So let me show you. On So on each of the sides, you will have these tiny little protrusions that you can kind of put your finger against, right? So you simply pick those up and the keyboard magically appears. I can't even begin to describe to you how satisfying this whole thing is. And one thing that I really like, and it's extremely elegant, is that it basically, it hides the keyboard and the keyboard is not against the screen. And the whole process of just doing this, it feels 2023. It's not like, hey, here's a keyboard and it, it's just very, very intelligent design. And that is position one and it looks like this. So at the back of it, you will also see that you have just a very discreet, remarkable appears. And for anyone interested to know how that looks like for somebody outside looking in, it looks basically like this. It just appears and it says that's your remarkable and that's that. Very stylish, nothing really uh, crazy going on. No, no tacky things at all. So on the side, it looks like this and it holds the device quite well. The overall sturdiness I think is really good because you can see that even though it's massive and held only by a magnet, I can move it around. I wouldn't shake it because you know, it's going to fall off and probably at some point it's going to fall off. And Remarkable 2 is a fragile device. So I wouldn't go as far as to shake it, but relocating it and just holding it around and just kind of moving it here and there, I feel confident enough to actually do that because the design is such and the magnets are such that they actually hold it nicely in place. Another thing that's important as well is those two magnets from the back cover, they fit securely and you don't have anything flapping around. So this whole thing, once it's transformed into a type folio, is very, very thoroughly designed and it looks really, really good. But that's not it. That's not the only thing you have. You also have this line here. And if you kickstand, so for example, let's say this is how it stands, and then you just push the stand back, this one is held by magnets to the device. So you just detach it from the magnets and that allows the device to fall flat on the ground. Be aware of though that there's no limit here and it's kind of wobbly. So this part um, basically relies that you have a flat surface on the ground and that looks like this. So let's uh, kind of zoom out a little bit so that you can see the whole shebang. So this is this is position one. For me, the action for going to the position two is twofold. Action number one, pull the remarkable towards you to detach the magnet. Action number two is simultaneously start pushing it back and give a helping hand for this one to flip in the opposite direction so it can go down. So in reality, that flipping will look very, very seamless uh, if you do it like that, because you will just do this and it goes down. And if you want it kind of uh, up, you just pull it up and you help that flap go back as well to attach itself there. Once you're done with this, you simply detach by pushing the remarkable towards the front. So just lightly push it until the, the magnet detaches itself. It folds itself down, fold it back here and you're done. Extremely original, extremely elegant, and something that I don't believe that I've seen before. 
And as a solution, I'm a sucker for good engineering and for innovating engineering. This is something that I really, really like. Now, before we get into the typing experience and how it works, I just wanted to kind of show you from the side the mechanics of this, how it works, because it's really, really nicely designed. So we have magnets actually holding back this plastic plate, which is a bucket that holds your device, right? So it is magnetically held from the both sides from here and on the corners there. So once you start moving it, it detaches relatively uh, easily. These magnets hold it a little bit harder and then you can see the guidelines. So you have a plastic hinge and you have this one that actually folds in there. So that is a basic mechanical hinge system and underneath here maybe you can see exposed magnets. There we go, there they are. So you can see exposed magnets and a contact as well, because that contact will be made with the parts here. So not only is that a magnet that snaps in place, but also when it establishes contact, I assume it also transfers the information and you have a contact here um, and a confirmation for the device, hey, I am in a docked state with a keyboard cover, so therefore I'm gonna flip into the landscape mode and have my keyboard attached. So that I think is a good thing. The only thing that it can be a point of failure is that um, when you have a hinge like this happening all the time, and if there's like a stripe cable that is going through there to carry the signals, and I assume it there is because it's gonna you know, carry the signal from the keyboard through this all the way to this one to, you know, transfer the signal into Remarkable. That might be prone to failure after on a very extended period of time. So we're not talking about a couple of years, but we're talking about maybe five, six years or more. When you're constantly bending a cable, a thin cable, doink, doink, like this, into a sharp angle, which is a 90 degree angle here, that is something that might be a potential mechanical point of failure over an extended period of time. I don't know what their stress testing methodology was and for how many uh, open and close operations has this uh, contact point being tested for. And now while we're talking about the design, there's only one other thing that I'm not a big fan of, and that is the nature of the Remarkable itself, which is, it is primarily intended to be used as a portrait device. However, this uh, forces artificially this whole platform into a landscape format. Now, landscape format on its own, it's not a problem, but we do have a issue here with the elegance of things because we have this wide surface here and suddenly my focus is not centered, my keyboard is here, but my, fo my focus is going to be pushed a little bit to the side. Not a big point at all. However, for 200 bucks and for the only typing capability that you will have for this device, this design, as brilliant as it is, has one missing point. And that is, they should have added another addition and they could have added it simply by having a rotational plate here on the back that would allow you to boink and then rotate your uh, uh, Remarkable and have it in either a landscape or in a portrait format where this whole bucket would basically simply rotate and allow you to use it like this or to rotate it and like that. That I think would have made a even more complete solution. There is an obvious limitation and point of preference that the Remarkable as a platform prefers to be in, which is portrait mode, which is natural. And I think this is just simply a slightly missed opportunity. If everything else was designed so well, that little hinge system here, like an off-centered hinge so that you can just simply uh, pull your device up and rotate it and have it like this, I think then it would have been a slam dunk because then you have this proper system, but in this case, no, we don't have it. We only have it as a landscape orientation. On to the keyboard itself. 
and it is of a very, very nice quality. The keys are full-size keys and they have a rather good travel of, I believe they say 1.3 millimeters or something, and it feels like a regular modern laptop. It doesn't feel like a flat little key, uh, key pad or, uh, sorry, uh, flip book cover. On the top you have your numerical uh, keys and you have your normal keys here with uh, shift, tab, caps lock, uh, control, alt and uh, option for Macintosh. We have an extended enter and uh, this is a Nordic version so I do have these keys but some of them are kind of doubled and some keys are kind of missing. For example apostrophe, normally I would have a normal apostrophe but in this case I need to use the alt and uh, apostrophe to actually get there and I'm not a fan of a tiny tiny backspace. I keep hitting enter instead of backspace when I'm typing because I am used to my pinky doing the thing uh, like this. So it is still in a good place to reach it with my pinky, but so is the enter here. Some channels were complaining that there's no function keys. Well, there's no need for an F1, F2 or thing like that because this is not your uh, PC or, or a Mac key, uh, keyboard. This is a remarkable keyboard. So it is using all of the additional systems here like a traditional kind of a keyboard. And um, it's not limited only to these things that you can see here. It has a list of shortcuts and we will cover them, but some of the functionalities are missing. And I think they are directly in relation to exactly those function uh, um, uh, functionality or function shortcuts. So far you only have Control W or Alt W to take you out of the document, right? But there's no way to go back, there's no way to kind of navigate through the system using the directional keyboards and things like that. The keys themselves, they are of a very nice plastic and the plastic itself is smooth but it gives enough resistance to kind of give you a very nice quality feel, uh, but it, you can feel definitely the relief of the letter. Typing in general, I think is quite good on it. Uh, however, you do have, for me at least, this area here was a little bit uh, problematic, but nothing terrible. So the overall impression of the keyboard as a quality is actually quite good and it feels quite comfortable to Type on. The sound is also quite, quite satisfactory. The surface down here is not plastic or anything like that. It's nicely covered by that same type of uh, very nice feeling uh, material, whatever it is, it's the same material on the inside and it just looks and it feels premium which it's supposed to do at, uh, at the asking price point. So it does deliver the build quality, the design and all of these things, mostly it does deliver. The only point is that you can't really tilt it and use it in a portrait mode um, as far as the bigger ones go. And for me personally, I think that uh, it's a missed opportunity that this plastic down here could have been the same metal color of the device itself to make it feel even more premium. Okay, now as for the functionalities and how things work, well, your Remarkable is normally in its portrait format. Um, and we know that Remarkable doesn't have an accelerometer, therefore it can't understand that it's in landscape format. However, because of the connections that I showed you, as soon as you establish a connection and it understands, hey, I got a keyboard, it's automatically flipped into a landscape format. And then you have your whole system is basically in landscape format and things seem to work properly. The very first time you connect a keyboard to the Remarkable, you will be automatically taken to the keyboard option, which is in the settings. And in here you will have the option to choose uh, which language you want to use the keyboard for. And when you go to the keyboard language uh, choice, you will have only the choice of these because those are currently the keyboard variants that you can use. The other thing that you can choose and you will have to choose at the beginning of setting up your uh, type folio is what type of shortcuts and key combinations do you prefer? Are you going to use it as a PC or Windows, which means that it's going to be control and another key, for example, control Z for undo, or if you're going to use the Mac related shortcut system, which is alt and 
another key or another letter in case of undo alt z for example and it also tells you the shortcuts menu will open when you press and hold the control for three seconds or if i'm on alt when you press and hold alt for three seconds and you can all of course uh, access this at any given time in settings keyboard and then you can set it up that way before i start typing let's hold the control for one two three and poink there we go we have our shortcuts which are very nicely displayed here and i think that it really works because you can switch between editing and navigation and you can find that we have shortcuts for title so control or alt i will be talking about uh, pc version so i'm going to refer to them as control if you're working as a mac just replace control with alt and it's all the same so control one two three and four are your uh, shortcuts for formatting so control one is title formatting of text subheading body text and bullet points one through four then you have your cut, copy, paste, and select all shortcuts, which are standard as Control X for cut, Control C for copy, Control V for paste, and Control A for select all. Then we go to the uh, general menu, such as undo, Control Z, redo, Control Y, and then you have also the option of symbol menu when you go Control, Alt, and Space. So that looks uh, like this. Then you have your uh, access to the symbols that are not included on the keyboard itself so that you can have an uh, access to all of it that way. As far as navigation uh, goes, you can have, again, standard ones for PC at least, and I think it's the same for Macintosh as well. Um, and they are uh, next word, which is control and the arrows. So you can skip to previous and next uh, word. Next paragraph is control and up and down. Uh, I would have preferred a tiny bit more space between the up and down arrows because this is really, really small, but uh, it, it is doable. And then you have a search function, which is control F. So you can search through your typed uh, document. And then finally, here's the only shortcut that I said for the system-wide shortcut, which is close the document or folder, which is control W. But that doesn't make too much sense because I can control W, but I can't do anything with my keys. And I would have expected to be able to do these things to kind of just go next previous and go through my documents here. But unfortunately, that's not implemented yet. I hope that the case is yet, um, but we'll see. However, at this moment, that's not something that you have. So I have been uh, testing it, as you can see here, quite a bit so that I can see how that works. I'm gonna show you how the typing works, but first I wanna kinda show you the general operations. Initially, you find it kinda difficult to kinda select something as a single tap, right? And that's because by default, you are going to be in handwriting mode. So in handwriting mode, you write, right? So you write, you don't type. In order to have access to any type of text controls, you have to be in the text mode and you can do that by this. And as soon as you're in typing mode, you will see the paragraph menu here, which is giving you all the options, you know, the, the four uh, uh, um, formats, typing formats that you have. And when we're in typing mode, then your touch is actually putting the cursor where you want it. So there are tap shortcuts that can actually help you get into the paragraph menu without even tapping here. So you can actually work in a fully focused way that you don't have to have this. So you can, all you need to do is basically double tap on a, um, a paragraph and you automatically get into a type mode or typing mode. When you are in typing mode, you have four shortcuts and they're all ta taps. Single tap places the cursor at a given point, right? So you can just kind of place it wherever you want. And it's fairly, um, fairly responsive and fairly precise. Double tap selects a word that you've typed on or where the cursor is. 
Uh, can you double tap here? Yeah, you can. If you are precise enough, then you can. Triple tap, one, two, three. I'm not precise enough, one, two, three. Select the entire paragraph and quadruple tap, one, two, three, four should select the whole thing and it does and you can tap uh, you can tap out you can tap anywhere on a single uh, word and a single tap will deselect everything so those are your main shortcuts and of course your normal navigations as uh, basically just uh, sliding up and down the page itself because this turns into an infinite page that they've introduced in 3.0. Now, as far as the typed uh, content goes, it is not going to match uh, all of the uh, templates. And they do say so. It's like it's not going to match some of the templates. And I'm kind of wondering which ones does it actually match. So the the, the small ones, the, for example, the small lined one doesn't match it. If I wanted to have a lined one, lined medium doesn't match it. Uh, lined large doesn't match it either. If I go to dots, mm, dots don't fit either. So dots small doesn't fit. Dots large. Nope, that one's offset as well. Let's try grid. Nope, it falls out completely. Uh, let's find grid small. Nope, doesn't fit either. So just so you know, that note that some of the typed, uh, some of the templates won't fit, translate that into most or to my knowledge, all none that I've tested do not fit the typed content on the Remarkable. All right, let's finally type so that you can see how that works. And let's just double tap here. And I can start to, and choose my uh, heading. So I'm gonna go Control-1 to choose the heading. I'm gonna in turn the caps lock on. And here's the thing, there's no caps lock indication at all. And even though there's no LED here, which I'm fine with, I don't want it to drain battery from my uh, Remarkable, but a simple overlay, just a simple symbol somewhere that you're in caps lock mode would be a normal you know, thing to have, but we don't have that. So you have to kind of guess, am I in uh, caps lock mode or not? So. And as you can see, they're quite small. So you will be making some mistakes. Then I'm gonna go to subhead uh, heading or subheading. And let's call it chapter one. And now we're in normal text. So this is how typing looks like. And then I can go, um, yeah, enter is for a new paragraph. And then I can um, say, and then quickly go to bullet points. Oh, I made a mistake. So control Z, right? Then I can go here and then this is going to be my bullet points here. So this is going to be a new list and I love the overall design. Missing the portrait mode. Excellent build. 
quality very very expensive oops so some typos do happen and I can just go control 3 and I'm back in this one or I can go now so my chapter chapter 2 etc and do some more writing 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 in here all right as far as navigation goes as you can see it's fairly fairly quick with this and the keyboards that we talked about so for example i want this to be chapter and the keyboard shortcuts the standard one control and to the side i can just jump uh, through the paragraphs, I can jump through the words. Um, have they implemented control? Yes. So one of the um, uh, shortcuts that they haven't actually mentioned, and it's quite an important one, is a standard operation one, which is control and shift. And you go like this, you will select each new word. And if you want to select a whole paragraph, you just simply go down and it selects the entire paragra paragraph. So for me, this is a far more natural way of uh, doing things, uh, simply because I'm used to doing things like that. So for example, I could just quickly select this, move all the way down here and then go control V and paste the content there. But that's not all. Um, you can combine your writing with the uh, typing as well. So the way that it's intended to be is that you can mark up stuff here and say this is blah right and then i can do some highlighting as well i can take a highlighter and then i can just highlight uh, <laughs> not like that that was not what i wanted i wanted to use a highlighter like this and then it snaps and then highlight like this this and this all right, and then let's uh, let's do another highlight here as well, because I want to show or test something. I haven't really tested this. So what it's supposed to have as a functionality is that they at least say that you're supposed to have the uh, written text should move with the typed text. So that would mean that I should be able to, and I can, I can add more text here and the uh, content is somewhat aware of uh, it being linked to each other. This is really, really good. So because what this allows me to do is just go hit enter here and then, he, oops, I need my uh, normal fine liner. Let's delete this. And here I can just add my little sketch of a dude who is typing on the new <laughs> Remarkable 2. Here's a chair as well. There we go. Let's put wheels. There we go. There's a table. Not getting distracted here whatsoever, right? Distraction free. Well, not for my brain, but either way. So you're typing on here and then it's like, oh, that's actually kind of cool. So then you may want to uh, move this around and place it into some place else. So let's say that, hey, maybe that one should be actually right around here. And here is where things are a little bit, uh, they, they could use a little bit more improvement. What I would like to be able to do is that it, they take this intelligence even further because your selection tool is aware only of your handwriting, right? So you can't do selecting of the text. That doesn't work at all. So the handwriting, the select tool is just the handwriting thing, which is fine. But what I would like to be able to do is that they add another level of intelligence for the text editor here. And when I start moving this one, that it actually starts popping the paragraphs, just the paragraphs themselves, up and down, above and below the selection set that is being moved. That's how you can actually implement that. So once you move it, it should be able to automatically displace this one underneath. And that when I release, 
that it actually moves the content underneath the pa the the picture itself. Uh, right now you get into a kind of a messy situation because if I do something like this and then I start, uh, let's double tap and I start tapping, the, the, these guys are linked, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but um, there should be a way to kind of, instead of just making room here, then going to a selection and that navigation now becomes a problem because you see, I can't scroll, so it doesn't really work properly. So now I'm in a, this is a practical situation where I'm not, I'm not able to do exactly what I want. It's just snapping, right? You can use two fingers for a situation like this to kind of fine tune it. So you can get to it, but it's not exactly a streamlined type of functionality. So you still can do it, which is fine. And let's see what does it do in this kind of an edge case scenario. Okay, that's good. And then here I can get back to my typing and I can just, whoops, uh, like this. And then I can simply go standard way of to, 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 to shift and up, right? And then one backspace puts it all back together and there you go. So you are able to, so for example, with the highlights, this is really useful because I can just go down here and I can say like, oh, add another, another point here, but my highlighting remains down there. So the functionality of this is quite, quite good, but it's not completely intelligent and it's not completely there yet. I love the fact that they have added this and that you have content awareness between the typed text and the handwriting. This is something that is crucial and it makes it a lot more usable than it used to be. So that definitely works. But I think that in cases of kind of moving things around and basically uh, there should be an option to uh, move a big selection and recognize and when to actually automatically displace paragraphs underneath on the, or, or uh, under the image or something like that. Maybe you could, oh, I'm just spitballing here, like I haven't thought about it, but one of the options could be, for example, because this is not always the case that you're gonna be using this, but you can select this. And as we have options here, cut and, and uh, copy and cut, you could have an option as well to have a warp mode, right? So you can set a warp mode for the selection. I mean, I'm no longer talking to the audience at this point. I'm just talking to the remarkable development team because I like this. And the, here's a the, here's the free hint. Add a warp mode here, like an icon. You already have like a user interface system. Just add another icon on the side. Warp mode, you switch it to on top, overlay, uh, or displace uh, 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 paragraphs. And once you set that, that will dictate how the selection is going to affect the typed text on the note itself. And therefore, in one go, you basically bypass all of these options by just having one here, one option here, and letting the user choose their case on a case-by-case -case basis. Because finding a solution that's gonna be you know, satisfying for everything, that's not gonna work. This way, you kind of solve that problem without any issues at all. And that's going to uh, really, really, really make things a lot, lot better uh, for, for this kind of system. But overall, I think that it works really, really well. My problem here is the landscape format because it's not meant to be in a landscape format. However, thankfully, you do have the zooming option, right? So let's now kind of, oh, if only the navigation was working better. Uh, and now we have some <laughs> oh, issues. There we go. So it's not an entirely bad thing. You can zoom into this mode, uh, which is okay. So I can start typing while zoomed zoomed in and this for the most part works rather well but as you could see 
the uh, screen focus is following the cursor, which is a good thing. However, depending on the amount of content on the screen, the um, responsiveness will vary and can be quite slow at times. It's a little bit kind of fiddly and what I think would be nice at the very least is if we had an option of, uh, ooh, not that, there we go, snapping, yay, great. We have the snapping thing now. Um, if we had an option of um, some either a shortcut or a gesture that would snap to the default width of the text because there's no way for us to actually adjust the width of the typed paragraph. Why? Well, because that's how the landscape mode works and that's the inherent problem why it would have been nicer to be able to have this because ultimately this is what it wants to be at, right? And then even here we can't adjust the width of the page itself, which is a limitation for sure. Um, so it would be nice to actually have an option, as you can see, he flips like really, really instantly, really, really, really nice. And also if I unhook and go back to, uh, back to here, he goes into this mode instantly. And if I just go here and then whoop, like this, then it goes into the mode that we talked about. So I think that this overall, I think that it really, really works and it has a potential to be something really, really good, but it's not quite there yet. There are no complete deal breakers for me, but there's, it's, it's a little bit incomplete. As I mentioned with the content awareness, basically a uh, selection set wrapping uh, against the text. So that's how you could solve that part. And also the formatting thing, I think it would be nice to have like a shortcut to allow you to zoom to the text or to allow maybe a wider formatting of uh, writing, whatever is actually easier for them to implement. Now, uh, their default typing position is this, and I think that it really works well, but for the purposes of this demo, I've been using it in the other position so that you can actually clearly see what's what, so that so it's easier, you know, so as you can see the responsiveness of the whole thing and everything else. Uh, to be quite honest, I also personally prefer this one uh, simply because most of my light is coming from the top, especially in uh, indoor situations and Remarkable 2 doesn't have a front light. So therefore my surface is more lit this way, but certainly this position works really, really well. And I think it's okay. Um, the Keyboard itself, as you've seen, it works good. Just don't do this. Don't, don't, don't write like that. Don't do that. Always use this kind of position. This is really, really important. Don't do this. Always this. So this is supposed to be, let's move it a little bit. That is supposed to be your kind of typing position, not this, like it was shown in one of the commercials. So. Uh, overall typing, I think it's quite good. Now, as for this controversial pose or the one that they call for writing. Now, a lot of people instantly said like, oh, that's bollocks, that's, that's blah, blah. That doesn't work because you're instantly going to put your hand onto the keyboard and then, uh, really, am I? Am I going to write, how am I going to write? My normal, my normal writing is like this. And granted, when I'm in a writing situation, my elbow is, let's put an angle like this, so you can see, my elbow goes on the ground and then I start writing. There's intelligence in this angle because when you have it like that, your hand, your, fore, your forearm, usually, not 100%, but usually will miss out on the keyboards themselves. So 
on the keys themselves. So let's move it like this. So that really allows me to write in the writing position that they have. <sighs> Additionally, my handwriting is atrocious. Yes, I know. Um, when you are actually writing, you are not in the typing mode. That is the key point here. Let me just see if they've put in a failsafe. I believe that if they're smart, they've done it. And they have. As long as you have contact with the screen and you are writing, you can press as many keys as you want on the keyboard and it won't affect it whatsoever. So let's try a little bit more here. And let's write and spam the keyboard at the same time and mostly, <laughs> there you go. So only when I'm uh, completely spamming, like face rolling over the keyboard, like a complete madman and writing and still it only catches a couple of them here and works for the most part. Now let's try the edge case scenario here. This is the only area where you will most likely your hand will start to affect these down here. So let's see. Yes, you do get a little bit of a thing. You will put your hand on it, but the angle will not the angle, but the fail safe mostly works. Yoo hoo hoo yoo hoo! <laughs> I'm not completely mad. That's my typo was yoo hoo hoo yoo hoo! So while I was writing down there, my writing position means that um, uh, my keyboard and my <laughs> is going to say yoo -hoo -hoo -yoo -hoo, which is actually a lot of fun but all kidding aside um come on focus yes um all kidding aside yes there is a case area here but as long as your uh, hand is resting on the remarkable which means let's say three quarters of the screen or a good four fifths of the screen are easily usable with your normal writing. The most bottom section isn't. And for that, we'll just slide up and continue writing in the area where it is. But I think that they've implemented this really, really well. And there was quite a bit of thought that got into this. They, they've implemented the fail safe so that you can't type while you are writing, which is great. And again, that engineering design is really intelligent because your arm and where your palm rests creates an angle under which the keyboard actually goes. So the accidental presses are not completely eliminated, but I think that they are placed at the very minimum considering the design overall. So there you have it. That is the remarkable keyboard folio. And I think that they've done actually a good job except for auto wake up and auto sleep. Why not? But yeah, that's the overall package. Transforms the Remarkable into a digital typewriter, but at a significant cost and at a significant weight and at significant thickness as well. So the Remarkable Type Folio. First of all, this isn't a folio. This is a cover. 
Anyway, <laughs> semantics aside, what do I think about it? I think that it's really remarkably well, pun not intended, honestly not intended, this one. Okay, exquisitely designed, hardware design. I'm really blown out of the water. The only thing that I wish they've incorporated was that tilt functionality. Then it would have been a freaking masterpiece. As it is, it's really, really good. It's exceptionally good and introduces something completely new. I love the fact that it hides the keyboard, that the keyboard doesn't lie on top of the screen. It doesn't really press on the screen. The, the functionality of it is really good and it's really original and it kind of maintains that modern yet minimalistic design, which Remarkable is all about. And when you put it all together, it's a pleasure to use this and to actually use Remarkable in this way. And for me, the integration is made in such a way that it makes perfect sense. And it's not like an artificial kind of crammed in thing. It does make sense and it does work. The biggest con for me would be the blunder that they've done with the hard launch and the unavailability and how that was the logistics of it, basically how it was mishandled. I can't say that it was handled well, it was mishandled and that's, that's a mess up. There's no other way around it. There can only be like an excuse. They should apologize for that, I think, publicly, and they should acknowledge that publicly in some way. Um, one thing that I forgot to mention, which was that if you're an existing Connect subscriber before the Typefolio was launched, you would get a $50 discount. So that is something that's also kind of important. So it goes down from $200 US dollars to $150 US dollars which makes it a bit better, but still kind of pricey, but a bit more in realms of reality. Then it's starting to, it's it's a very expensive thing, but then you can start to maybe justify it. At 200, it's very hard to justify it. But the thing with Remarkable is it doesn't have a Bluetooth. So therefore you can't really, you don't, without hacking it, you don't have an alternative to this, you know, this, if you want to type on a Remarkable 2 and you don't want to hack it, this is the only way that you can go about it. So the question of is it worth it is, um, is, is basically a redundant question because uh, the, the only question that should be there is do you need it and uh, does it make sense to type on the Remarkable? And to answer that question, I would ask another question myself to answer it, which is what would then the typing experience need to be like? Well, it needs to be like a digital typewriter, right? And I don't want a full on text processor. I have much better, more powerful tools for that. I want a digital typewriter. And the answer to that question is mostly yes. It's not perfect. It needs some things, for example, formatting, portrait orientation would have been great. We can't have that. Hardware-wise, you can't have that on this one. So it's only landscape. So there are ways to actually remedy this with software updates, with the formatting that I was talking about, that it can actually fit it onto the place, that you can have templates that fit the formatting of the text, which we don't at the moment, and things like that. But for a general type of use, focused typing, focused writing, and just trying to remain disconnected from things and just doing all of this stuff in one platform. Um, I think that it actually, surprisingly for me, I think that it works. Is it perfect? No, but the hardware side of it, pretty much like the Remarkable 2 when I was really, and I'm still impressed by the Remarkable 2, how it's actually designed. The same thing goes with the Typefolio as well. And I think that it's, extremely impressive design and an excellent build quality. And as such, I think that it's of, it fits seamlessly into what Remarkable offers. Now, a bigger question is, is the Remarkable environment and limitations that are associated with, is that something that's right for you or not? That's an entirely different communication here. But if the answer for that is yes, and your question is, Will this fit? Will this ruin the Remarkable 2 experience or not? I think not. I think that it fits it perfectly and I think that it fits really well. And as far as I'm concerned, even though it adds a lot of weight, de facto, it adds a lot of weight, it adds a lot of thickness, tits, titskness, um, well, you can just simply 
you know, it's magnet, so you just take your remarkable out of it, and you can use this as a, as a little docking station, so you can just plop it in, and it just works. So, none of these things are a deal breaker for me. Could it be more ideal? Of course, yes, it could be, so it's not an ideal perfect, but it's pretty, pretty darn good. To be honest, when I heard the initial news, it's like, oh, it's just like, oh, a keyboard cover, right? But it's not just a keyboard cover, it is a part of an experience. The way it folds, the way it unfolds, the way you use it, the way you interact with it, the quality of it, the typing of it, the sound of it when you're typing on it, the typing experience, what you can do with it, what you can't do with it, the linking with the, between the typing and the handwritten and marked up notes, very, very important software point. So, Traditionally, Remarkable has really kind of blah, a sketchy history with the software open, but that part there is really, really good, and there's strong potential for it to be even better if you introduce a warp mode for handwritten selections to actually move, so it's actually interacting and moving paragraphs up and down. Then, then this can actually quickly turn into something very, very powerful. And I intentionally didn't want to go into reviewing the OS 3.2 features, which is basically what is required for you to use the, uh, um, uh, the type folio keyboard. So that's something that you have to do out of the gate. You can't use it unless you have 3.1, because there's going to be a dedicated video that actually goes through all of the features and functionalities that have been introduced in uh, 3.2, including the new desktop and the mobile app. So that's going to be a different story. And here I wanted to focus just on the uh, hardware product itself and how it actually works. Um, another thing that you can kind of look forward to as well is that I'm going to be doing a direct back-to-back -back comparison between the Remarkable with Type Folio and the Books Tab Ultra with the keyboard cover. And I'm going to compare the performance uh, as far as functionalities can be compared because you can't compare them exactly the same because they're different platforms. And I'm going to be also comparing the typing accuracy and some other stuff as well. Everything that I can actually kind of measure so I can give you kind of a, a, an objective comparison between these platforms here. So what's the final verdict on the Remarkable Type Folio. I think it's really rather simple. If you enjoy the remarkable environment and you feel that your workflow has a need and would benefit from uh, typing and having basically a digital typewriter as well in your remarkable, then this product of course makes sense because it's the only alternative that will allow you to do that. Is it worth 200 bucks? Nope. But what what can you do? I mean, if there's no alternatives, there's nothing you can do. It's just, I think it's ridiculously overpriced. It's wonderfully designed and, and built, but the price is absolutely way too high. 150 bucks, the upper limit, but you could maybe justify it that way. And then that's basically what you get if you are already a customer. So then uh, basically the Connect uh, subscription customer uh, uh, subscriber. Then yeah, it would make sense. Uh, otherwise, it's a it's a tall order for for that price. But is it a sexy uh, addition to Remarkable? Yeah. Sure as heck, yeah. And does it work well? Yep, it does. And it's surprisingly comfortable. And I really can't get enough of that unfold and fold functionality and the fact that, you know, the keyboard is hidden and it's just such a nice package. It just makes, makes a lot of sense for the whole remarkable story, which wasn't an easy thing to do. So good job there. All right, that's it for me. If you liked the video, please like, subscribe and do the usual things because they really do help out the channel. And also comment down below what do you think about it, what your use case scenarios might be and what are the things that, uh, what's your opinion on the whole uh, Remarkable type folio thing because it's an interesting thing to share. And if you have some personal experiences with the ordering or not receiving it, receiving it and the communications, please do share so that other users can have a good information regarding the Remarkable 2 type folio and the purchasing experience and the using experience if you have some. Thank you so much for watching. Stay safe, stay healthy and see you in the next video. Bye.